Okay, so um, originally we were going to do uh, about Hackett uh, at the start of the year, but obviously this has been postponed. Um, so we're going to do a little bit about Hackett, but we're going to really do uh, more about what the developments have been since then. Um, there's been a huge uh, amount of um, progression in the industry, uh, a number of bills going through Parliament, um, and uh, a number of developments. So I'm going to run through those very quickly. Um, we're going to touch on cladding as well and the implications of that, but um, uh, the presentation um, is as follows. So we're going to look at the Hackett report, uh, but only very briefly because things have moved on uh, far beyond that. Uh, the Bill and Safety Bill has come out, um, and we're going to look at very briefly look at that as well. Um, and the Fire Safety Bill is also uh, going through Parliament as well. And we're going to look at the external war certificate, uh, the EWS one, and some of the um, some of the challenges around that as well. So, looking back at the Hackett report, um, this was immediately following uh, this was following Grenfell. Um, I think the the everyone recognised that our action needs to be taken, and the the report was very detailed. Um, but essentially, um, the the key findings were around roles and responsibilities. Uh, clarity of those roles indeed. Um, the regulations and guidance was uh, in some way amb ambiguous uh, and inconsistent uh, and how that was all going to change. Um, we needed to drive compliance, so uh, it was very important that, um, that uh, everybody had the right uh, duties uh, and they, they could actually drive compliance all the way through the process. Competence, clearly a big issue. Um, uh, very patchy across the across the industry, and that needs to be looked at. Uh, obviously, very much connected with um, uh, cladding was around product testing, labelling, and marketing. Um, and there was a lot of desktop uh, reviews being undertaken on cladding systems. Um, so some cladding systems weren't being tested; they were actually just being um, uh, done as a desktop review, uh, and whether that was right or wrong. And obviously, it's very much about the residents, uh, the voices of residents going unheard. Uh, they weren't being listened to, and that was a big concern, uh, particularly for uh, for government. So, what the government have done about this is to put together the Building Safety Bill. Now, this is currently going through Parliament, um, so it's still being discussed, and there's many aspects in the in the bill uh, documentation which is still to be uh, clarified. However, um, it's uh, it's a very robust uh, bill. It's uh, about 145 pages long, I think it is, and it, uh, it goes into a lot of detail uh, about how it's all going to work going forward. But the the general scope is as, as follows: the it's going to apply to high-rise residential buildings and those buildings which are deemed to be high risk. Now, uh, as far as I can see, there's no actual definition. The definition of high risk is still being um, developed. However, um, it appears that it's going to be basically anywhere with um, sleeping risk. Uh, so it'd be residential and it could include things like uh, care homes, uh, schools of residence uh, and things like that. Um, it's going to apply to buildings above 18 metres or six storeys. And uh, it appears that we're going to have, um, there's going to be more requirements around sprinklers uh, being used in buildings, uh, particularly new ones. Whether this gets extended to existing buildings is still debatable, but it's um, it's it's certainly um, for new buildings. Um, a new national regulator for building safety. Uh, this uh, you know this will be under the HSC. Um, it should be a brand new regulator, and they'll be responsible for implementing uh, the the safety requirements uh, and monitoring and enforcement. Um, New responsibilities for competent, and it's very important to say that we're competent duty holders, um, particularly around design, construction and management of buildings. Um, and linked to that is going to be three gateways, which will be part which will need to be passed. And now these can be very strict gateways um, and there's going to be a lot more oversight by the enforcing authorities and building control around how buildings are designed uh, and constructed and operated. Uh, and it's um, it's a, it's a subject zone, right? Um, there's going to be a lot of ongoing management responsibilities. You're going to need to register high rise, high risk buildings with the regulator, and they're going to go back to issuing basically issuing certificates to show that the buildings are in fact safe. So, what's the role? Just very briefly, obviously, to over, oversee the requirements, ensure accountable persons are carrying out the duties of properly. Now, the accountable persons 
will effectively be those in control of the property. So it could be the landlords, it could be managing agents, but basically it's, it's the people who have wholly or to some degree a control over that building. Uh, obviously, they'll be overseeing the building regulatory system, uh, the competence systems that will need to be put in place. There is very much a desire to have uh, an ombudsman type role for residents so they can they can register their complaints, similar to what you can do with you know, the water industry and the gas industry and things like that. Um, mandatory uh, reporting uh, where incidents do occur. Obviously, they are looking to recover the costs of all this through something I guess is similar to um, to the health and safety fees regulations. Um, but uh, that's yet to be uh, clarified as far as I'm aware. Um, and of course, they're looking to uh, beef up the enforcement powers. So it's very much around setting the scene, setting responsibilities and 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 keeping holding people accountable and then obviously taking action where people have been deemed uh, not to comply with their responsibilities. There will also be various panels, one of those being residents, um, and they have a voice in development of its work. So uh, they will appoint a panel of residents who will who they will consult on a lot of the work that they the national regulator will do. So duty holder roles. Now, it's going to be very much aligned with CDM. There's going to be um, a lot of responsibility placed upon the client, the principal designer and the principal contractors. Now, this could, this almost could be a, a subject in its own right. We could do a, an hour's presentation simply on uh, how it's going to affect CDM and the duties or the extra duties going to be placed on those various roles. It's going to be, there's going to be a lot of work. Um, the principal designer are going to have to take on a lot more duties and a lot more responsibility, um, uh, particularly through the gateway process, which I'll run through very briefly. Um, the accountable person, usually the owner, but anybody in control, basically. And they very importantly, is going to be an appointed building safety manager. Now, both of the accountable person and the building safety manager will need to be registered with the um, regulator. So you'll basically notify them who that's going to be. Now, the accountable person is fairly straightforward. That's probably going to be the owner or the managing agent. The, um, the building safety manager, well, that's possibly going to be someone like the health and safety manager within an organisation, I would guess. So it needs to be someone who with, um, who's relatively senior and obviously has the, um, has the authority to, to, to make things, to change things and make things right. So the accountable person's role, well, that overall, they've got to keep the residents safe in the high rise buildings. That's essentially it. Um, and they've got to listen to resp and respond to residents' concerns. So they've got to have processes in place whereby residents can make, um, raise their concerns, make complaints, and then they've got to be able to show that they're actually going to be able to demonstrate. Now, this could be about anything. It could be about cladding. It could be about internal uh, arrangements within the building. It could be, it could be pretty well about anything at all. But they've got to be able to show that they have got um, processes in place and that they are actually addressing the um, the concerns of the tenants. Um, they need to maintain a safety case risk assessment. Now, this is going to be very much around risk assessment, so it's going to be very much around an FRA, but it goes a little bit further than that in terms of also having uh, looking at maintenance inspection, uh, emergency arrangements, things like that. So it's going to be the whole way in which that building is going to be managed from a from a fire safety perspective. They need to appoint its building safety manager. So this is going to be a named role. It's going to be very similar to the duty holders under CDM where you have a person that is named as say the principal designer, but they're going to be a building safety manager. And as I say they will need to be registered with the re registry authority uh, who have the power to veto over those people. Um, uh, and that's uh, um, and the thing is, the building will need to be registered. So if uh, if you do have before you can actually occupy a building, um, the building will need to be registered. So high rise buildings will need to be registered with the regulator before you can occupy them. So building information. Now this is one of the key things from Hackett was about um, lack of uh, handover information and really the golden thread. So uh, there's going to be three gateways and they're all linked. So design, construction, and occup occup occupation is going to be linked. So the information from design goes to the construction teams and, and so on and so forth to the, uh, to the occupiers. Um, 
each gateway will be defined and and very much um, people who are accountable for managing risks will be named and identified so that if anything does go wrong they can be held accountable uh, the golden thread of information so the the way the information is is compiled communicated maintained uh, and passed on to other people is absolutely vital and this is a this is a key finding of the hacker report in terms of how that will be maintained going forward Regulations have been around for some time now, particularly in terms of Regulation 38 of the building regulations, but there's a huge um, uh, difference between how that's been implemented so far. So things around cladding, for instance, where um, uh, information about cladding systems have not been adequately passed on to the to the building owners. So at the moment, we're we, for instance, are doing a lot of cladding investigations where um, we're having to literally take cladding panels off to actually find out what the systems are and how they've been in installed. Um, this should have all really been passed um, through to, uh, through Regulation 38, um, so we didn't, shouldn't have to do this. And going forward, there's very much a reliance on everything being digitised, so um, everything being electronic, so BIM potentially, um, so 3D models, um, the full works in terms of embracing new technology uh, and going forward. So moving away from paper, uh, things like that. Um, and very, very importantly, and one of the key problems uh, that we've always found is that these models will then have to be kept up to date. So it's no good taking on the BIM model and then allowing it to stagnate and become um, uh, you know, out of date. It needs to be maintained as do all the records, and then you can then pass all that information on to whoever it might be, a new building owner, whoever it might be, going forward. So the GRIT3 gateways, now these will be very strict. Um, basically, the, the, uh, the gateway one is about design. So this is about um, the actual design of the building being passed by the local planning authority. Um, the regulator will have oversight of that on high, high rise buildings. buildings. Um, there's going to be strict control around this, so um, they will they will give expert for, um, um, uh, input into the local planning authority and uh, influence, which will influence their decision making process. So if the uh, building uh, documentation isn't robust, then you could find your applications rejected, and this this will place a new emphasis on on the accuracy and the comprehensiveness of the data going through to the uh, for the planning authority gateway two this is construction so this need you can't start work until you've had the authority to proceed now this is basically a hard stop so uh, unless you can demonstrate you've complied with building regulations uh, and that could be through adb or things like bs 9999 or 9991 then um, you may you won't be able to start. You won't have the authority to proceed. Uh, this is a key a key aspect uh, of of the gateway process. And then gateway three is very much about occupation, um, and and obviously getting a, 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 a having approval to um, actually how you manage the building and all the appointments need to be made. The fire safety bill is something separate, and this is also going through Parliament at the moment. This is a little bit more simple. And, and what it's doing is it's, it's adjusting the regulatory form fire safety order um, to include two things. One, flat fire, uh, flat fire entrance doors, which I think most people accept are under the RRO uh, and have been adopted uh, within many fire assessments uh, since then. And of course, internal uh, fire spread is a very important part of having a, an external fire uh, cladding system, but you also need to make sure it doesn't spread internally as well. The, the side that is most debatable is that the FRAs will now need to consider the facade of the building. Now, people like the FRA, the Fire Industry Association, are saying that it never did under the fire safety order, um, and therefore it's unreasonable now to do that. Um, there are issues around this, uh, I have to say. Now, it's a good idea because I think it's, it's all part of that fire spread, and if you're looking internally, then why aren't you looking externally when you're doing a fire assessment? But there are many aspects of cladding uh, and external wall systems which are very difficult to determine just by looking at them. So very difficult to determine exactly what they are. So a fire risk assessor who may be an expert on fire risk may not be an expert on cladding systems. 
So they may not know exactly what it is they're looking at. And very importantly, as we've found, is that a lot of the cladding systems may look externally to be OK, and you may be able to even determine what they are. But the question is, have they been installed correctly? And the only way you're going to be able to do that is if you start doing intrusive investigations. So the FIA are currently advising that, um, that the external wall systems are identified, but the, the, they're actually not assessed in terms of risk. They're actually recommended that further investigation is undertaken. Now that brings me on to the EWS uh, certificate. Now this was um, this was jointly uh, developed by RCS and um, and the mortgage companies. Um, and the idea is that um, the uh, the EWS is a form which is set uh, in terms of format, and it allows um, um, uh, landlords, and, um, people responsible for buildings to. Uh, ask a industry expert, uh, someone who is suitably qualified and competent to assess the external wall system and to basically um, sign a form which takes them down two paths. One is whether it is safe or secondly, whether it's uh, further action needs to be taken. Now, the form itself is, is probably a good idea in the sense that it provides some um, information to the uh, mortgage companies before they lend the money to the people who wish to uh, obviously sell their flats. The, the issue is, is the way the form has been written in our opinion, um, because it places um, complete liability on the person signing the form. Now, the, it's all well and good if you've been overseeing the installation of a cladding system and you can absolutely verify that it's been installed, installed correctly. But of course, even when you're doing um, ad hoc um, uh, in intrusive investigations on part of the building, you can never absolutely confirm whether the system has been installed correctly or not. And, and the EWS really needs to, um, rather than having an absolute liability, it really needs to be have something like um, health and safety legislation does, where it's as far as reasonably practical or something like that to limit the uh, the liability that potentially could come to the person who's just signed the form. So, um, but currently it applies to buildings over 18 metres and it's last for 15, five years, but um, ultimately um, a lot of people are actually doing it uh, on a lot of other buildings as well. Um, where they're deemed to be at risk. And that, uh, that concludes the presentation.